Hi everybody and welcome back to another chapter of Matilda. So yesterday we read the chapter about her second miracle and I wonder what's going to happen today. Is she going to perform another miracle or maybe she's just going to, we know we're going, she's going to Miss Honey's house for tea. Oh, so I wonder what's going to happen. What do you think is going to happen? Well, let's see if we can get any clues from the name of the chapter. So today's chapter is called Miss Honey's Cottage. So now we know quite a lot about Miss Honey already, but there's lots still we don't know about Miss Honey. So today we're going to go to Miss Honey's house. So I think we might learn a little bit more about Miss Honey in this chapter. So what do you think? Well, let's get started, shall we? Miss Honey's Cottage. Miss Honey joined Matilda outside the school gate and the two of them walked in silence through the village high street. They passed the greengrocer with his windows full of apples and oranges and the butcher with the bloody lumps of meat on display and the naked chickens hanging up and the small bank and the grocery store and the electrical store. And then they came out the other side of the village onto the narrow country road where there were no um, people anymore and a very few motor cars. And now they were all alone. Matilda all of a sudden became wildly animated. So it means she uh, started talking a lot more. It seemed as though a valve had burst inside her. A great gush, gush of energy was being released. She trotted beside Miss Honey with little hops of her, her fingers flew as if she would scatter them um, of, to the fourth of the winds. And her words went off like fireworks with terrific speed. So Matilda is really excited. So she's tramping around and her fingers are going everywhere and she's talking a lot. And she's, like I said, she's really excited, and most probably because she's really excited. It was, um, it was Miss um, Honey this and uh, Miss Honey that and Miss Honey. I do honestly feel like I could have done anything in the world, not just tipping over a glass and little things like that. So she's she's excited about going to Miss Honey's house, but she's also really excited about what she's just done. And I think she's already thinking about what else could I do? I feel like a tip topple over tables and chairs, Miss Honey. Even when people were sitting on the chairs, I think I could push them over and bigger things, too, and bigger things than chairs and tables. Oh, I only have to take a moment for my eyes to get stronger. So, like I said, she's really, her brain's constantly going about all the different things she's going to be able to do with this new power. The stronger. And then I can push it out. This strongness um, at anything as, as long as I am staring at it as hard enough. I have to stare at it very hard, Miss Honey, very, very hard. And then I can feel it all happening behind my eyes. And my eyes get hot. I just as though they were burning, but I don't mind it in the least. And Miss Honey. So you can see, here's Miss Honey, she's walking, and you can see that Matilda, like I did, she's jumping and she's she's very, very excited about what's just happened. Calm yourself down, child, calm yourself down, Miss Honey said. Let's not get ahead of ourselves and too worked up so early in the proceedings. But do you think it's interesting, don't you, Miss Honey? Oh, it is interesting, all right, Miss Honey said. It is more than interesting, but we must tread very carefully from now on, Matilda. But why must we tread carefully, Miss Honey? Because we are playing with mysterious forces, my child, that we know nothing about. I do not think they're evil, but they may, they may be good. They may even be divine. But whether they are or not, let us handle them carefully. So what Miss Honey is saying is, wait, let's slow down. Let's calm down and let's actually take a bit of a step back, maybe, because we don't want to rush too quickly. Matilda wants to rush and see what she can do. But Miss Honey's saying let's be careful because these powers that Matilda seems to have, we don't know where they have come from. So let's be really careful with them. These were very wide words from a very wise old bird. Matilda was too steamed up to see it in that way. I don't see why we have to be so careful, she said, still hopping around. I'm trying to explain to you, Miss Honey said patiently, that we are dealing with the unknown. It's a completely unexplainable thing. The right word for it is phenomenon. It's a phenomenon. Am I a phenomenon? Matilda asked. 
It is quite possible that you are, Miss Honey said, but I'd rather um, you didn't think as yourself as anything in particular at the moment. What I thought we might do is explore this phenomenon a little further. Just take the, just the two of us together, but making sure things are very carefully all the time. So you want me to do more of it then, Miss Honey? That is what I'm tempted to suggest, Miss Honey said cautiously. Good, good, Matilda said. I myself, Miss Honey said, I am prob probably far more bowled, bowled over than by what you did than you are. And I'm trying to find some reasonable explanation. Such as what? Matilda asked. Such as whether or not it's good, got something to do with the fact that you're quite exceptionally um, precocious. What does that word mean? Matilda said. A precocious child, Miss Honey said, is one that shows an amazing intelligence early on. You are an unbelievably precocious child. Am I really? Matilda said. Of course you are. You must be aware that look. You must be aware looking at your reading, looking at your mathematics. I suppose you're right, Matilda said. Miss Honey marvelled at the child's lack of um, constant concrete and um, self-consciousness. I can't help wondering, she said, whether this sudden ability has come um, to you or being able to move, being, uh, being able to move an object without touching it, whether it might not have to do something with your brain power. You mean that there might not be room in my head for all those brains so something has to push it out? That's not quite what, what, what I mean, Miss Honey said, smiling. But whatever happens, and I say is, I'll say it again, we must tread very carefully from now on. I have not forgotten that, that strange distant glimmer on your face after you tipped over the last glass. Do you think it could actually hurt me? Is that what you're thinking, Miss Honey? It did make, it did make you, it did make you, it made you feel peculiar, didn't it? It made me feel lovely, Matilda said. For a moment or two, I was flying past the stars on silver wings. I told you that, and I should tell you something else, Miss Honey. It was easier than the second time, much easier. I think it's like anything else. The more you practice it, the easier it gets. Miss Honey was walking so slowly so that the small child could keep up with her without trotting too fast. It was very peaceful out there on the narrow road and that the village was behind them. It was one of those golden autumn afternoons and there were blackberries and splashes of old man's beard in the hedges and the hawthorn berries were ripening scarlet for the birds when the cold winter came along. There was tall trees here and there on, on either side, oak and sycamore and ash and occasionally a sweet chestnut. Miss Honey was wishing to change the subject for a moment. She gave the names of all these to Matilda and taught her how to recognise them by the shape of their leaves and the pattern on their bark on their trunks. Matilda took all this in and stored the knowledge away very carefully in her mind. They finally came to the gap in the hedge on the left-hand side of the road where there was uh, a five-barred gate. This way, Miss Honey said, she opened the gate and led Matilda through and closed Closed it again. They were now walking along a narrow lane. There were no more than a. It was no more than a rutted cart track. There was a high hedge of hazel on each either side. You could see clusters of ripe brown nuts in the green jackets. The squirrels would be collecting them very soon, Miss Honey said, and storing them away carefully for the bleak months ahead. So um, when they're walking through, instead of uh, what Miss Honey's trying to do, is she's trying to calm Matilda down by telling her to look at all the trees and explaining about which tree is which. Um, so, and you can see that looking from the picture that Matilda has really calmed down. You mean you live down there? Matilda asked. I do, Miss Honey replied, uh, but she said no more. Matilda never once stopped to think about where Miss Honey might be living. She always regarded it, her purely as a teacher, a person who turned up out of nowhere and taught at school and then went away. Do any of us children, as she wondered, uh, ever stop to think about, um, ask ourselves where our teachers go to school um, when the school is over for the day? So what it's saying is Matilda never really 
thought of Miss Honey anything other than a teacher. She knew she was at school, but she didn't think where she was before or she didn't think where she was afterwards. And actually, that's a really common thing that um, lots of the children that I have taught over the years, some of think I lived at school, some of the little ones, and um, some of the children thought that uh, I lived with my mum and dad, which um, I don't um, anymore. And um, so, well, I'm in my house right now, as you can see behind. So uh, Matilda is learning that actually Miss Honey is a real person and that she does have a house and things like that. Do we wonder if they live alone or if there's a mother, a home or a sister or a husband? Do you live by your, all by yourself, Miss Honey? She asked. Yes, Miss Honey, very much so. They were walking over to the deep sun-baked mud tracks on the lane. You ha um, and you had to watch where you put your feet if you didn't want to twist your ankle. There are a few small birds around in the hazel branches, but that was all. It's just like a farm laboured cottage, Miss Honey said. You mustn't expect too much of it. We're nearly there. So basically, Miss Honey says that she lives alone and um, it's like she lives in a little cottage. They came to a small green gate, half buried in the hedge on the right, um, and was almost hidden by overhanging hazel branches. Miss Honey paused with one hand on the gate and she said, there it is. That's where I live. Matilda saw a narrow dirt path that le led leading to a tiny red brick cottage. The cottage was so small it almost looked like a doll's house rather than a human dwelling. The bricks were built um, were of old and crumply and were pale very, were, and were pale very pale red. It had a slate roof and one small chimney and there were two windows at the front. Each window was no larger than a sheet of tabloid newspaper and there were clear there was clearly no upstairs in the place. So do you know what a house is called when it's just a downstairs? It's called a b b bung it's called a bungalow. So if a house doesn't have upstairs, just a downstairs it's called a bungalow. On either side of the path there was a wilderness of nettles and black Berry thorns and long brown grass. An enormous oak tree stood over shadowing the cottage. Its massive spreading branches seemed to be enfolding and embracing the tiny building and perhaps hiding it as well from the rest of the world. Now that is a lovely description there. So you can see her house but you can only just see it and the description I really like was uh, perhaps hiding it as well from the rest of the world. So what they're saying is there's so many plants and trees around Miss Honey's cottage. It's as if it is, the other description they use is embracing the tiny building, as if it's hiding it from the world. So why would someone like Miss Honey want to live in a cottage which are uh, on her own, which no one can really see, you wouldn't know it was there, and it's as if it's hiding from the rest of the world. Hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Ooh, well, let's keep reading and let's see if we find some answers. Miss Honey, with one hand on the gate, which she had not opened yet, turned to Matilda and said, A poet called Dylan Thomas once wrote some lines, and I think of every time I walk up this path. Matilda waited and Miss Honey, in a rather wonderful slow voice, began to recite the poem. Never and never, my girl riding far and near, in this land of the hearthstone tales and spelled asleep. Fear or believe that, that the wolf in the sheep white hood, loping and bleating roughly and blithering shall leap, my dear, my dear, out of the layer in the flocked leaves in the dew dipped year to eat your heart in the house in the rosy wood so every time she walks up that path she thinks of that lovely poem there was a moment of silence and matilda who had never before heard such great romantic poetry spoke aloud and and was profoundly moved it's like music she whispered It is music, Miss Honey. And then, as though she embraced, embarrassed, 
at having revealed such a secret part of herself, she quickly pushed open the gate and walked up the path. Matilda hung back. She was a bit frightened of this place now. It seemed so unreal and remote and fantastic and so totally away from this earth. It was like an illusion in Grimm or Hans Andersen. So basically she's saying that that because of the poem and because of the fact it's so remote and it's so enchanted and all that, it kind of feels a bit like an illusion. Um, it kind of feels remote and it's kind of made material to feel a bit uneasy about it. It was the house where the poor woodcutter lived with Hansel and Gretel, where Red Riding Hood's mother lived, and also the house of the seven dwarfs and the three bears, and all the rest of them. It was straight out of a fairy tale. Come along, my dear, Miss Honey called back, and Matilda followed her up the path. The front door was covered with flaky green paint, and there was no keyhole. Miss Honey simply lifted the latch and pushed open the door and went in. Although she was not a tall woman, she had to stoop low to get through the doorway. Matilda went in after her and found herself in what seemed like a dark, narrow tunnel. So we're starting to hear a little bit about the house. So um, it said the front door was covered with flaky green paint. So it means the paint's coming off the front door. There was no keyhole, so she can't lock the lock the door. Um, which would suggest if you can't lock your door, there's nothing very valuable inside. Um, she had to stoop low to get through the doorway, so the doorway is, is very low. And when she came in, it, it felt a bit, when she went in the house, like a dark, narrow tunnel. So again, why would someone as lovely as Miss Honey, why would she want to live in a little cottage which kind of feels dark and narrow and she has to bend down to get in? Hmm, this is very mysterious. Let's carry on. Let's see if it gives us any clues. You can come through to the kitchen and help me make some tea, Miss Honey said. And she led the way through the tunnel into the kitchen. That's if you could call it a kitchen. It was not much bigger than a good side um, clothes cupboard, where there was one window in the back wall and a sink over the, under the window. But there were no taps under the sink. Again, um, against another wall, there was a shelf, presumably be for preparing food, and there was a single cupboard above the shelf. On the shelf there stood a Primus stove, a saucepan and a half bottle of milk. A Primus is a little camping um, stove that you fill with paraffin and you light it at the top and when you pump it, you get um, pressure for a flame. So, have a look at, this is the bit of Miss Honey's house we've seen so far. So, like the description says, Miss Honey says come into the kitchen, but it does say if you can call it a kitchen, because you really couldn't, because there's the sink, but remember there's no taps in the sink. Um, here's her cooker, which is little camping cooker. Her milk's just out, so she doesn't have a fridge. She has one little cupboard there. So it's not really a kitchen, and remember it's all very closed and it's very small. You can get some water while I light the Primus, Miss Honey said. The well is out of the back. Take the bucket. Here it is. You'll find a rope in the well. So she has to. She can't, obviously, because we know there's no taps. She can't get, um, she can't turn the tap on to get her water. So she has to go into the back garden and get the bucket from the well. Just hook the bucket onto the end. Of the rope and lower it down. But don't fall in yourself. Matilda was more bemused than ever now. She took the bucket and carried it out to the back garden. The well had a little wooden roof over it and a simple winding device and there was a rope dangling down into the darkness, um, into the dark bottomless hole. Matilda pulled the rope up and hooked the handle, hooked the handle of the bucket onto the end of it. Then she lowered it until she heard a splash. The rope went slack. And when she pulled it up again, lo and behold, there was a wa there was water in the bucket. Is that enough? She asked, carrying it in. Just about, Miss Honey. I don't suppose you've ever done that before. Never, Matilda said. It is fun. How do you get enough water to fill your bath? I don't take a bath, Miss Honey. I wash standing up. I get a bucket full of water and I heat it over this little stove and I strip and I wash myself all over. So that's another thing, Miss, we've heard about the house is... She doesn't have a bath. 
she washes standing up which would also mean that she probably doesn't really have a shower in her house um, either. So she hasn't really got a kitchen. She's got a sink, but she hasn't got any water coming to her house. And she hasn't really got a, a bath or shower. Hmm, this is a very curious cottage, isn't it? Do you honestly do that? Matilda asked. Of course I do, Miss Honey said. Every poor person in England used to wash that way until not very long ago. And they didn't have Rambo Primus. They used to heat their water over the fire on the hearth. Are you poor, Miss Honey? Yes, Miss Honey said. Very. It's a good little stove, isn't it? The Primus was roaring away with a powerful blue frame and already the water in the saucepan was beginning to bubble. Miss Honey got the teapot from the cupboard and she put some tea leaves into it. She found half a small loaf of brown bread. She cut it into two thin slices and then... From a plastic container, she took some margarine and spread and spread it onto the bread. Margarine, Matilda thought. She really must be poor. So Matilda has asked um, the question, are you poor? And Miss Honey said yes. So now we know that the reason why Miss Honey is in such a small little house is because she is so poor. But it's very confusing this because Matilda, um, not Matilda, Miss Honey is a teacher, so she has a job which will pay her money. So I wonder why she lives in such a small little house. I wonder if there's anything else going on there, or I wonder if maybe that's that's just the situation. Hmm, very curious, very mysterious. Miss Honey found a tray on it and with two mugs. The teapot, half a bottle of milk and a plate with two slices of bread. I'm afraid I don't have any sugar, she said. I never use it. That's all right, Matilda said. In her wisdom, she seemed to be aware of the delicacy of this situation. And she already was taking great care not to embarrass herself, her companion. So Matilda's trying to make Miss Honey feel better by saying, that's OK, I don't really need sugar. Let's have it in the sitting room, Miss Honey said, picking up the tray leading out of the kitchen and down the dark little tunnel into the front room. Matilda followed her, but just inside the doorway of the so-called sitting room, she stopped and she stared around in absolute amazement. The room was so small and square and bare, it was as bare as a prison cell. In the pale daylight that entered the room from a t single tiny window in the front wall, there, but there were no curtains. The only objects in the entire room were two upturned wooden boxes to serve as chairs and a third box between them for a table. That was all. There were no pictures on the walls, no carpet on the floor and only a roughly unpolished wooden planks. There were gaps between the planks where the dust and bits and grime had gathered. The ceiling was so low that with a jump Matilda could nearly touch it with her fingertips and the walls were white but the whiteness didn't look like paint. Matilda rubbed her palm against it and the white powder came off on her skin. It was whitewash, the cheap stuff that they used in cow sheds, stables and hen houses. So we're learning a bit more about the house. Um, when she goes into the what Miss Honey calls the living room, she said it was small and square and it was as bare as a prison cell. So there's only a tiny window. It's very dark. Remember, there's no curtains. Also, there were no objects uh, really in the room. The only uh, three objects were wooden boxes. So there was one, two for tables, so sorry, two for chairs and one for table. And that was it. There were no pictures, no carpet, nothing. Now, this is again very peculiar because Miss Honey has a job. The school will give her money. We, we don't obviously know how much, but there's nothing in her house. Now, normally, if you go into people's houses, not every house, but normally people have photographs on the wall or pictures, things like that. And they normally have photographs or pictures of their family. But there's nothing in Miss Honey's house. And I imagine if we went into the Trunchbull's house, there might not be that many pictures. But Miss Honey, she seems like such a lovely person. So very weird that she doesn't have that much in her house. Matilda was appalled. This Was this really where her neat and tired and trimly dressed school teacher lived? Was this all she had come to back to after a day of work? 
but it was unbelievable and what was the reason for it there was something very strange going on around here surely so matilda has noticed and she's clever she's thinking well this this can't be right miss honey put the tray down on one of the arm turned boxes sit down my dear sit down she said we'll have a nice hot cup of tea help yourself to bread both slices are for you i never eat anything when i get home i have a good old tuck in at school lunch and that keeps me going until the next morning so that's another thing so miss honey said she never eats anything at home and she doesn't really have much in the house and I would say that the reason she doesn't eat anything at home is because, well, she can't really cook anything. She hasn't got a fridge to put any food in or anything. So she says that she eats a lot at lunchtime and that keeps her going till the next morning. Now, how would you feel if you, well, if you had a big lunch and then you came home, you didn't have anything, maybe you had tea or dinner. And then you don't get, um, you don't, and when you get up in the morning, you might not really have any breakfast. Oh, I think I'd be very hungry. Matilda perched herself carefully on the upturned box and more out of politeness than anything else she took a slice of bread and margarine and started to eat it. At home she would have been having buttery toast with strawberry jam and probably a piece of sponge cake to round it off and yet this was somehow far more fun. There was a mystery in this house, a great mystery and there was no doubt about it that Matilda was longing to find out what it was. So Matilda really wants to find out why Miss Honey lives in this really small house. She, Matilda's very curious, as am I. Are you really curious? Do you want to know? Well, there's one more page left, so let's see if it gives us any more information. Miss Honey poured the tea and added a little milk to both cups. She appeared not to be um, least ill at her ease, sitting on an upturned box in the bare room and drinking tea out of a mug that she had balanced on her knee. You know, she said, I've been thinking very hard about what you did with the glass. It's a great power you have been given, my child, do you know that? Yes, Miss Honey, I do, Matilda said, chewing her bread and margarine. So as far as I know, Miss Honey went on, no one else in history of the world has been able to compel an object to move without touching it or blowing it or using any outside help at all. Matilda nodded but said nothing. The fascinating thing, Miss Honey said, would be able to find out the real limit of this power of yours. Oh, and I think you can move just about anything there is. But I have my doubts about that. I would love to try something really huge, Matilda said. What about distance, Miss Honey asked. Would you always have to be so close to the thing that you were pushing? I simply don't know, Matilda said, but it would be fun to find out. So that's the end of our chapter today. It was quite a long chapter today. And Miss Honey and Matilda are talking about, could she move bigger things? Does she have to be so close? Can she be much farther away for it to work out? So maybe they're going to have a little experiment like we do in science to see actually how far she has to be or what size object. So we've learned quite a lot about Miss Honey today, but I feel that there's slightly more we might learn. Maybe we might learn that tomorrow. So I'll see you for today and um, see you tomorrow. Bye.